I'm here to talk to you about an ideology that I'm sure some of you know about. It is called Hindutva. That's a strange word. Hindutva is a word that basically denotes Hindu nationalism. Now, those of you who do not know, who have not heard of Hindu nationalism, must be wondering what is this about. But I would imagine that most of you are very, very aware of two other ideologies. One is Zionism, that needs no introduction. And the other is white racism, that also needs no introduction. Both these ideologies of Zionism and white racism are fundamentally anti-democratic ideologies that are supremacist to the core because they believe in the supremacy of one set of people in exclusion of all the other people. We've seen what Zionism has done to the Middle East, especially in the last 75 years. The history of white racism, especially in the United States, has been extremely toxic. And now, we have the ideology of Hindu nationalism. Just to give you a sense of what Hindu nationalism is, today is 28th of May. On this day, 28th of May, in 1883, a man was born in India. His name was Savarkar. That was his last name, Savarkar. He was a Brahmin, a Hindu Brahmin. In the year 1922, he first propounded this ideology of Hindutva. It is interesting how through the history of India, hundreds of years, for hundreds of years, Indian Hindus and Christians and Muslims and Sikhs and Parsis and people of other faith, faiths had lived together in peace and harmony. But around the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century, especially the British colonial masters, they started creating a divide between Hindus and Muslims. And that is when Savarkar created this ideology of Hindutva. This ideology is very clear. It says that India is the land of the Hindus because their forefathers started out in this country and they created the religion of Hindu, Hinduism thousands of years ago. And the ideology of Hindutva also says that Muslims and Christians are foreigners regardless of the fact that Christianity had existed on the Indian subcontinent for 2,000 years, regardless of the fact that Islam has existed on the Indian subcontinent from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this ideology said that Muslims of the subcontinent and Christians of the subcontinent were foreigners in their own country where they had lived for centuries, for generations. Because their religion, the ideology said, Savarkar said, had come from outside of India. This ideology started taking root around that time. And in 1925, just two or three years after Savarkar first propounded this ideology, a new organization was founded. The name of that organization is RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. Fast forward 100 years. Today, India is ruled by a political party which is an offshoot of the RSS. It is a Hindu nationalist party. Today, India's president, India's prime minister, India's vice president, India's cabinet of ministers, they are all people who belong to the RSS. They are sworn to the Hindutva ideology of Hindu nationalism. Their one goal, single goal, is to convert India 
into a Hindu country. India was freed from British colonial rule in 1947 and in 1950, fully 72 years ago, India gave itself a pluralist constitution that says all Indians are equal. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains, as well as people of no faith, they are all equal. This country belongs to all of them. But today, the RSS wants to change that constitution. They have already started with the citizenship law. Some of you may already know that in the last eight years that the RSS has been in government in India, the attacks on Muslims have increased many, many fold. Tens of thousands of people have been put in prison. Thousands of Muslims have been lynched merely for being Muslim, walking down the street with their, just because they're wearing a skull cap or they have a beard, they have been attacked in full public view and murdered. Tens of thousands of Muslim girls are being denied education in India because they wear the hijab. Mosques are attacked, vandalized, set on fire, demolished by the government. Muslim businesses, Muslim homes, they are all under attack. Now, the citizenship of India's 200 million plus Muslims is also under attack. This is an existential threat. This is, as has been said by a very, very reputed organization in the United States, Genocide Watch, this is a genocide of Muslims underway. Now pause for a minute and think about it. India has more than 200 million Muslims. By some estimates, the number is about 250 million. If India's Muslims were to be counted as a country, they would be the world's fifth most populated country. It is such a large body of people and now we see there is intense hatred created by this ideology in India's society, in India's government, in India's legislatures, federal as well as state legislatures, where conversion is being criminalized, where Muslim men marrying non-Muslim women are being caught by, by the police and being sent to prison, where there is a fundamental attack to the very existence of Muslims because they are Muslims. Now you might ask, there is so many problems in the world. If there are so many countries where Muslims live and there are so many problems that Muslims in other countries face, why should we be focus, focusing on India? There are two reasons why India has to be the number one priority, especially for American Muslims, especially for the global Muslim community also. The first reason is that this ideology of Hindutva is not anymore confined to India. It has now traveled across the globe. In Australia, in the United Kingdom, in the Baltic countries, in Germany, in Canada, and of course, right here in the United States of America, Hindutva ideology, the ideology of Hindu supremacy, is all around us. There are over a dozen organizations that are very closely connected with the RSS in India. These are organizations such as the Hindu Swayam Sevak Sangh, HSS, which is a mirror image of the RSS. There is a Vish Hindu Parishad in India, there is a Vish Hindu Parishad in America. There is a Hindu American Foundation which does political advocacy here and it does not tolerate any criticism. Just about a few months ago, in July last year, they filed, the Hindu American file, uh, Foundation filed a defamation suit against five people for calling out its closeness, ideological affinity with the Hindu supremacists. One of the people who have been accused of defamation and 
is being sued by Hindu American Foundation, is sitting right here. He is my colleague and the executive director of Indian American Muslim Council, Rashid Ahmed. And there is intense pressure that is being brought by these Hindutva organizations on members of Congress, on city councils, on U.S. senators, U.S. government. Right now, these organizations are going around the United States with a traveling exhibition and trying to fool the people of this country, elected officials at the county levels, at city levels, at state levels, at federal levels, that, oh, we are good organizations, we support pluralism, we support multi multiculturalism, we support the fundamental ideals of the United States of America. But in truth, in truth, what they are doing is they are building up support in the United States for Hindu supremacy in India. They are building up support in the United States for Islamophobia in India, for Islamophobic policies of the government of India and the government of various provinces and states in India. They are the epitome of visceral, vile, evil hatred towards Muslims. They are influencing government decisions. Most of you must have heard that, in, uh, that, that Congresswoman Ilhan Umar brought the bill on Islamophobia that passed the House, that is now in the Senate. The biggest opposition, the biggest opposition to that bill in the Senate is coming from the Hindu organizations, or rather I should say the Hindu nationalist organizations in the United States of America. They have been sending emails, they have been making phone calls, they have been pressuring senators not to take up this bill. When the United Nations decided to recognize Islamophobia, the Indian ambassador to the United Nations, he was the only one who stood up and said, we oppose this decision. Recently, in the last couple of years, just one example, it comes from the city of Naperville, which is close to Chicago in Illinois, where the local Muslim community was trying to exp expand the, the Islamic Center. And when they, when they submitted their application to the town planning board, suddenly the town planning board was besieged by tens of thousands of opposition, emails, phone calls, and they were stunned because they had never, it's a sleepy town, they had never seen so much of opposition for a routine application to build a place of worship. And when they started investigating, what did they found, find? They found many of those emails, many of those phone numbers were not only not from Naperville, not only not from the Chicago area, not only not from Illinois, but actually many of them had originated from out of the United States of America. In history textbooks in the state of California, the Hindutva organizations for years have waged a war in an effort to force the California State Education Board to designate Islam as not a good religion and Muslim rulers of India in the past centuries as invaders, as cruel rulers who committed a genocide of Hindus. None of, none of this, of course, is, is rooted in history. None of this is a historical fact. But they do not care about facts. They are consumed. It's like white racists. It's like what we saw in the city of Buffalo merely 10 days ago, that this false narrative of replacement of the white people triggered a man who was 18 years old to go and kill 10 people, 10 unarmed, civilian, innocent people. That is the ideology that has taken root at a massive level. This was the first reason I gave you. The second big reason is, as I said earlier, one of the largest populations of Muslims globally lives in India. India has been a beacon of democracy in the last 75 years. After the, after the Second World War, a number of countries around the world 
raced to freedom from colonial ownership, colonial rule. And it is remarkable how a poor country such as India, which literally was so impoverished, it did not even have, for generations there had been no education. People were poor, they lived in the villages, they were illiterate, and yet India was one country that chose democracy over authoritarianism after freeing itself in 1947. No other country in Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, even East Europe, comes close to the absolutely amazing example of India in the last 75 years. And India has showed the way. Do not forget that Martin Luther King Jr. said that I read Marx, I read Angels, I read all kinds of great leaders in history, but it is only when I read Mahatma Gandhi that I realized that the way forward for the Afri African-American people, the way forward for America's civil rights movement is through what Gandhi taught us, non-violence. Two months ago, with my family, my wife and child, we went to Selma, the small town in Alabama, where in 1965, in the month of March, a few hundred people in the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. decided to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they were set upon by the local white Ku Klux Klan and the government there. And the rest, as I said, is history. Fast forward, we are living in a time now where the Hindu nationalists are hobnobbing with the white racists. Steve Bannon, you Google and you will find his pictures. He was a keynote speaker at one of the events organized by Hindu nationalists in America. Look up the pictures of 6th of January insurrection at US Capitol in Washington DC and you will find a man waving the Indian flag that man has been connected with the Vishwa Hindu Parishad of America. This is a very serious threat. This ideology, like I said, is not only opposed to Muslims in India, it is not only opposed to global Muslims, it is also opposed to global peace and global progress. I am not overstating the case when I say to you that the biggest threat to multiculturalism in the West today comes from Hindu nationalism. As some of you know, I am a Hindu myself. I work for a Muslim organization. I work for the Muslim community. A lot of people often ask me, Brother Ajit, you are a Hindu. Why do you work for Muslims? And I tell them, I do not work for Muslims or Hindus or Christians or Jews. I work for justice. I work for liberty. I work for freedom. And these are fundamental values that human society has learned through centuries of struggles. That we must all, we all of us must believe in these fundamental values and practice them. In conclusion, I would like to say to you that a hundred years ago, when Savarkar, who was born today, 28th of May, when he propounded the ideology of Hindu nationalism, at the very same time, Mahatma Gandhi, who needs no introduction, was propounding his vision of the Hindu religion, which was fundamentally inclusive, peaceful, and believed in coexistence. As we all know, Gandhi was assassinated, and he was assassinated by a man who was a disciple of Savarkar. In fact, Savarukar was also accused in the criminal trial of masterminding Gandhi's assassination. Today, India is at crossroads. Being the second most populated country in the world, it is now the world which is also at crossroads. India is racing towards authoritarianism. It is racing towards despotism. It is racing towards mass genocide of Muslims and God knows who else 
because if 250 million Muslims cannot be safe in a country, then the 30 million Christians in India will not be safe. We have to fight the good fight here. We have a job right, we have a job cut out for us right here in the United States of America. Please support this good fight, all of you. I urge ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, and all the other organizations that are represented here to accept, understand, and imbibe the fact that unless and until we come together to fight Hindutva right here in the United States and defeat it in the United States, discredit Hindutva, discredit the organizations that are peddling Hindutva, unless we do that, we will not be able to bring peace in our own society and we will definitely see, definitely see a horrible tragedy unfold in India. I would say, let us take a pledge today that we will not, we will not leave a stone unturned. We will not spare any action in reaching out to Congress in reaching out to the executive branch, to the White House, to the National Security Council, to the U.S. Department of State. As an organization, we do that. Other organizations also do that. But we need the community to step forward. We need Muslims of all backgrounds, all ethnicities in the United States to come together and ensure that we are fighting this to the last mile as a community, as constituents in different districts, as residents of towns and cities and counties and states, we take the battle to its political, logical conclusion. Remember, Savarkar's ideology wants all Muslims out of India. If not out, Savarkar's ideology wants Muslims in India to go to prison, to lose their citizenship, and to eventually be, be killed. We cannot allow that. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum once again.